so we've looked at first what is the interior solution or what will be the, uh, the, the solution and the response of a vertically integrated uh, ocean to a Windsor's curl and we obtain this better balance. But then we realized that that wasn't enough. And so Stommel added a piece to that virtual balance and what he did was adding a bottom drag, a linear bottom drag to the solution in order to balance the input of momentum from the wind stress curve. Okay. And so we developed again an interior solution which is obviously in virtual balance. Okay. And so this is the standard model with the uh, linear drag at the bottom which we know now that is not realistic and so today we will add a different model to the solution and see a slightly more realistic model to the wind driven jars. But anyway what he did is adding a linear bottom drag and so the solution was this meridional flow which would balance the input of momentum by the Winston's curl and frictional effects at the uh, bottom of the ocean. Okay. So when can this term be neglected? That will be when this parameter r, which is the linear bottom drag, is much smaller than beta. Okay. And so we define this, this number r. Okay. And so that is possible when you have this beta much larger than r over l, Well, l is the length of the uh, uh, large scale flow, so the interior in this case. So when frictional effects can be neglected, then we are left with this vorticity equation. Okay? So the Winston's curl is balanced by beta. And so the response of the ocean to a Winston's curl is developing a meridional flow. Okay? And so this is this virtual balance that we have developed in the first place. Okay? So beta V, where the bar it means vertically integrated, that is equal to the Winston's curl on the surface. So you have a Winston's curl at the surface and the ocean responds by changing beta and developing a meridional flow in the ocean. Remember this is vertically integrated. Okay. Which is just this. Beta V is equal to F naught d by dz of the vertical velocity. And so now what we have by adding the Winston's curl and, and, the, uh, and the Ekman layers at the top and the bottom is that we're developing a uh, vertical velocity. Right? So that vertical velocity will start moving uh, the interior of the ocean. And this was the uh, physical interpretation of, of the um, this balance for the interior. There's a part missing here on the left of the schematic which would be now we know that that's the western boundary current. Okay? So just focus on the subtropical jar blue lines center. Okay, So for that particular Winston's curl if you remember your Ekman transport, we are in the northern hemisphere, is directed towards the center of the subtropical, uh, of the subtropical gyre. That makes a convergence and therefore a vertical velocity downwards. Okay. So you have Ekman downwelling. The Ekman downwelling is squashing down isopycnals, in that case the thermocline. And so how does the ocean respond below that thermocline? Remember it's a vertically integrated ocean you squash it, it's not going to change its relative vorticity because we've derived a scaling and we said that the, the large scale flows is not going to change its relative vorticity, what it's going to do is change its planetary vorticity. And so the only way to maintain uh, vorticity there is by changing F. Okay. And so in this particular case what it's going to do is move towards the equator in order to conserve planetary vorticity, so it's going to diminish uh, F. Okay, and so that's this vertical transport for the uh, interior of the ocean. So now if you add, is it? No, okay, so this is the interior solution. If you integrate, uh, you just take the Winston's curl, and you compute this virtual balance with a boundary condition, 
this is what you get, which is not bad, but we see straight away that there's something missing on the western side of the basins. All the streamlines, they hit the, uh, the continents. And so there must be a boundary layer there in this particular case in order to close the streamlines and get a more realistic uh, solution to the uh, wind-driven gyre. And so we uh, developed a solution for a boundary layer. So we took again the standard model, the first equation there, okay, and we know and we uh, eight dimensionalized all the variables according to a simple square basing of length L. And once we uh, no dimensionalize all the variables, we get this equation. And we remember that epsilon is r over beta l, much smaller than 1, for the large scale flow. And so now what we're going to do is solve this equation by noting that the solution is going to be made of two parts. An interior solution, where we have this vector balance, and the boundary layer correction phi. Okay. And in that phi, the uh, frictional effects must be important. The interior solution, of course, is when this no-dimensional parameter epsilon is much smaller than 1, so frictional effects can be neglected. Okay? And so you recover this Verjup interior solution. Okay? You integrate this, you get a, an arbitrary function g, you do all the tricks that we did, we uh, simplify the wind stress curl to get it more analytically tractable, and so we got this curl expression and so we substitute it into the interior solution and we got to this solution okay. we define the arbitrary function g to be equal to c minus g over the curl and so we got to this point and now we have to make two choices we need to satisfy one of the boundary conditions where uh, the string function was equal to zero so that could be at the eastern side or the western side, so x equals 0 or x equals 1. If psi is equal to 0 at x equals 0, then that means that c is equal to 0. Whereas if psi is made to be 0 at x equals 1, then c has to be equal to 1. Okay. So the interior solution will satisfy the boundary condition either on the eastern side or on the western side. But we still don't know which one, both are mathematically valid, but only one is physically plausible. Okay, so you could have this solution or this solution. And so the boundary condition will be satisfied here on the east or here on the west for a given wind stress curl. Okay? The interior solution will be the same towards the equator for this wind stress curl. Okay? But the, uh, the, boundary, the boundary condition will be on one side or the other side. And so therefore the boundary correction will be on the opposite side. Okay, so what was the boundary solution? Then now we look for a solution for phi, the boundary layer correction. Okay. And that is supposed to be a region much smaller than L. And so what we do is to develop a stretch coordinate because that region is supposed to be much, much smaller than, than L. And so what we do, we stretch the coordinate in X and we define that new coordinate to be alpha. Okay. And the boundary could be at X equals zero or X equals one. We still don't know where the boundary correction is going to be. And so it could be given by this expression or this expression. So alpha could be zero at x equals 0, or alpha could be 0 at x equals 1. We still don't know. Okay, so you put the uh, interior plus the boundary correction into your equation. You manipulate that a little bit. Okay, you get to this expression. And you know that the leading order balance is going to be between this term and this term, which are divided by epsilon, which is a small number. And so the leading order balance is given by this equation. You can look for a simple solution to that. 
And you see straight away that the solution grows in the negative direction of alpha, which is something that we don't want. Right? So we want alpha to be positive so that the solution decays exponentially towards the interior solution. Because in the interior solution, the boundary correction has to be very small. So it cannot grow into the interior solution. And so we impose alpha to be positive and A to be equal to zero. Okay. And so that means that we need to choose x equal epsilon alpha so that alpha is positive for positive x. So we know already which one to choose, c equal zero or c equal one. Okay. So this solution of the uh, boundary correction is telling us that the boundary layer is a western boundary layer. Okay. It cannot be an eastern boundary layer if it has to satisfy all of our conditions. And it decays towards the east for increasing alpha. Okay. So for increasing alpha, the solution of the boundary cor correction decreases exponentially towards the interior. Whereas if we put the boundary correction on the east, the solution would increase exponentially as alpha grows. Okay? And that is not possible because the correction cannot grow into the interior solution. So the only valid solution is this. So now we know where to put the boundary correction. We need, we need to put the boundary correction on the west. And so we know that the interior solution is going to satisfy its boundary, correction, its boundary condition on the east. Okay. So if the boundary condition must be satisfied at x equals 0, so this has to be equal to 0 at x equals 0, so you can go back to your solution, the total solution plus the interior plus the correction. We know the expression for the correction. We can plug it in. That has to be equal to 0 at x equals 0. And so if this is equal to 0, then b is minus the interior solution. Okay. So the boundary layer correction is phi minus the Winstress curl exponentially decaying as x grows. Okay. So the boundary layer correction is proportional to the interior Winstress curl and that makes sense because it will have to balance the input of momentum by the Winstress curl. So it has to be equal and of opposite sign. And so the full solution, the interior plus the correction, is blah blah blah. You go back to the dimensional solution and it's this expression. Okay. And for a chosen Winstress curl and a single jar solution, you can go to figure 4.9, which is this. Okay. So now we have put the interior solution to satisfy its boundary condition on the east. We have placed the uh, boundary layer correction on the west, satisfying a boundary layer, a boundary condition on the west at x equals zero. And so we know that for this simple Winstress curl, this is the solution, the analytical, the numerical solution of the analytical problem. Okay. What is the width of this boundary layer? Okay, so this is the boundary layer correction, and how how thick that is. We know the relative importance between beta and uh, linear bottom drag. Right. Now for friction to be small, this has to be much smaller than 1 or R over beta much smaller than L. So that's the interior. When you go into the uh, boundary correction, the length scale L is becoming the length scale of the boundary correction. And in that case, is not much larger than the frictional effects because frictional effects are important there. And so these two must balance each other. And so L, which is on the order of the uh, width of the boundary layer delta, then delta is equal to R over beta. So in the Stommel problem, the thickness of the uh, boundary layer is proportional to the linear bottom drag, of course, and beta. Okay. So the larger the bottom drag, the larger the width of the uh, boundary layer. Okay. So that was the um, 
the stomach problem. And now we will try to understand why beta is so important in any of these wind-driven uh, problems that we are developing. So we can go back to the expression that we have in the uh, stomach problem, okay, which is beta, the median flow, that is equal to a wind stress curl minus a linear bottom drag, right? So this is your friction. This is your wind input of vorticity and this is your beta contribution. Okay. So you have an input of vorticity by the Winston's curl and that is balanced by a meridional flow. But you also need a linear bottom drag. Now imagine you are on an F plane. Okay. Now, an F-plane means that F is equal to F0, a constant. So if F is a constant, beta is equal to zero. So this term vanishes. Okay. And if that term vanishes, that also means that the vertical geostrophic velocities are also equal to zero. There would be no squashing of the uh, isopiclones and there will be no meridional flow induced by the changes in beta. Okay. So that is equal to zero, so that means that these two terms are equal. And that means that these two terms are going to balance each other everywhere. There's not going to be a boundary layer correction. There's not going, there's not going to be the need for a boundary layer correction. Remember, this is linear bottom drag. So the input of vorticity by the Winston's curl at the surface will be balanced by linear bottom drag everywhere. And this is true if curl of tau equal the curl tau top is equal curl of tau bottom. Okay, so this is the top ECMO layer and this is the bottom ECMO layer, yes. We are talking about the boundary layer, but we keep saying uh, what, will, uh, what, what about the, the drug at the side? That is coming next. So Stommel didn't introduce uh, horizontal frictional effects. Um, Stommel introduced the need for a bottom Ekman layer, where you had bottom linear drug. Okay, so he said, okay, you have input and momentum by the Winstress curl, that momentum must be balanced somewhere, let's put some linear drag at the bottom in a vertically integrated model of the ocean or a homogeneous ocean. Okay. So you have wind stress curl, wind stress at the surface and linear bottom drag. What he found is that you have two kinds of solutions, one where you have an interior transport where You have an interior transport where here um, tau is balanced by beta. Beta moves because of the input of vorticity by the wind stress. And so beta changes and so there is an interior flow. Okay. And then there is another region where frictional effects are important. And so you develop a boundary layer in your vertically integrated or homogeneous model of the ocean. The boundary layer, you can put it on the left or you can put it on the right. You need to conserve mass, so all this interior flow that is going, in this case, to the south, has to come back to the north. Okay? So you're going to put your boundary layer correction either here or here. We find out mathematically that the boundary layer correction has to be on the west. And here, R is going to balance beta, because beta is going to change because the flow is 
moving meridionally. So beta is changing. So now who's balancing beta is not the input of vorticity, but is the uh, frictional effects that is balancing beta. Okay. But what Stommel added was linear bottom drag, not side frictional effects, which is actually the next step. Okay, so if we are on an F plane, F is a constant, beta is equal to zero. And so these two terms are balancing everywhere in the, uh, in the domain. So the curl of tau at the top is going to be equal curl of tau at the bottom. And we know the expression for curl of tau at the bottom in the bottom Ekman layer, which is d over 2, the vorticity of the just rocket flow. So there is no boundary layer solution. Everywhere, the uh, input of vorticity is going to be balanced by linear bottom drag. And so what you get is the solution at the left. Okay? There's no boundary layer correction. And so everywhere, the balance is between the Winston's curl and the linear bottom drag. So you have a totally symmetric solution. Okay? And what you get here is the Winston's curl. So you develop a Ekman mass transport to the right. F is positive. F is positive. So you have a mass transport to the right. You have a convergence towards the center. And what you develop is just trophic velocities around this convergence center. And so you have a totally symmetric gyre with no boundary correction. Okay. There is no interior solution. There is no beta. So there is no net Sverdru balance with a meridional flow going, for example, towards the equator. And so there's no need for a boundary layer bringing back all this interior flow, uh, in this case, to the north. Right? This psi interior doesn't exist anymore, so there is no boundary layer correction bringing all that mass back to the north. You just have asymmetric gyre going around this convergence center. Okay? So that that's that's yes. The curve T B like tau B is the the, the, the bottom drag? Yes, so this is the, the curl. So if you have if you go back to the solution of the uh, bottom Ekman layer, okay, so we had at the top we, we got a curl of tau at the top. Okay. And the bottom Ekman layer solution what was the curl of some tau, whatever that was at the bottom, okay? And then we, uh, we found out that the curl of tau at the bottom was equal to the vorticity of the geostrophic flow, okay? So the curl of tau at the surface, and in this case, tau is wind stress, is equal to curl of tau at the bottom, and in this case, tau at the bottom is proportional to the uh, vorticity of the geostrophic flow. So that was the solution of the uh, top and bottom magma layer. So this means that everywhere there's a balance between these two. And so everywhere the input of vorticity at the surface is balanced by the uh, linear drag at the bottom. There's no need for a boundary correction. And so but the, the question, as you, as you were saying, is that we saw in the Stommel model that the, uh, the return flow, this return flow, returning the interior Sverdrup flow, is on the west. Is it really physically uh, justified to use linear bottom drag? It's not, because the wind stress is not going to be felt all the way to the bottom of the ocean. So linear bottom drag is not a physical way of removing input of vorticity in our wind-driven jars. So obviously we'll have to use 
some lateral friction here and not a linear bottom drive. Okay. But that was stomach problem was a first solution trying to explain the wind driven drive. And so you can look at these solutions, okay? So the one at the top is if f is equal to zero. Okay, you take the same equation and you set f equal to zero. There's no rotation, okay? So imagine you have a cup of tea. It's not rotating, f is equal to zero, okay? But you add some vorticity, so you steer your tea. What is going to happen if you look from the top, you're going to see the T circulating as those blue streamlines here at the top left. Okay? So there is a gyre, but it's not because F exists. Okay? There's no F. There's no rotation in this uh, frame of reference. And if you look at the surface elevation of your T, it's going to look like that. Okay? So it's going to look like... It's going to... Uh, uh, squash towards the uh, sides of the cup, right? So it's going to be zero at the center and elevated as, um, as you approach the, um, the sides of the cup, okay? So that's, that's the solution that you get if you steer your cup. Then if you add rotation, so F is equal to a constant, F is equal to F naught, this is what you get. You get the same streamlines if you look from the top, Okay. It's a symmetrical gyre. F is constant. There is no beta, so there is no interior flow and boundary western boundary correction. Okay. But now, if you look at the surface elevation, is a different one because you develop a geostrophic balance because you have F. Okay. And so what you get is convergence to the center. Okay. So you see that the uh, elevation is higher towards the center. So you get conversion to the center, and then you develop a geostrophic flow around the uh, streamlines, these streamlines, okay? And so what you will get is not a minimum at the center and then through a centrifugal force elevation to the sides, but you actually get a, a hill in the center of the cap now. You have a convergence in the center because of Are we supposed to get out? We're safe. Maybe. Okay, so now you in, now you get the uh, typical convergence because of Ekman transport converging mass to the center, and then you develop a geostrophic geostrophically balanced flow around the convergence center. So now the surface elevation is going to look like that. Totally symmetric around the center of your windsurface, for example. Okay? But the streamlines, they look the same. In one case you are in just rough balance and in the other case you are not. Now if you add beta, this is what you get. You get the stomal problem. Okay? You get a subtropical gyre, but now it is squashed to the west. That's because beta is not equal to zero. And so now you get an interior solution and then a return flow on the western side. Okay? And so this is much more like reality. And this is why this is why you need beta to explain why wind driven gyres are squashed to the west. Okay? F equal to zero, no rotation, F is equal to a constant, F is variable, and so you have beta. Okay? So now we're going to confuse things a little bit. Okay? <laughs> well, not to confuse, but actually, uh, so, so far we said that you have an input of vorticity and you have a sverger balance. But that is not enough you need a way of removing that input of vorticity and so we added a linear bottom drag. And we already realized that linear bottom drag is not realistic because the wind stress cannot be felt all the way to the bottom. 
but you probably have in mind this concept that you need friction to develop a Western boundary. So we develop the Western boundary solution and we find out that the boundary correction is on the West after we introduced friction. So in the interior, friction is negligible and so we are in symmetric balance. Then when and where friction is not negligible, then you have a boundary correction where friction is felt and is important. And that boundary correction we find out to be on the West. So you probably think that in order to have a Western boundary correction, you need friction. I did, but I really did. Okay? But actually, friction is not the reason for the Western boundary correction. Friction is not the reason for the existence of a uh, Western boundary current. Friction is a way of removing the vorticity. So friction is a way of balancing. In the interior, you have a wind stress, which is balanced by beta. In the boundary layer, beta changes because the flow goes up. And so how do you balance the change in beta? You do it with friction, in this case, linear bottom drag. But linear bottom drag is not the reason for the existence of the western boundary curve. Linear bottom drag is a way of balancing the fact that beta changes, okay? which is different. Okay? So the Western boundary current doesn't exist because of friction. Friction is a way of balancing vorticity. So you have a Western boundary current. How do you balance vorticity? It's through friction. But friction is not the uh, reason of the existence of the uh, Western boundary current. The existence of the Western boundary current is so the reason is, you know already, because you've done atmospheric dynamics. And the reason of the existence of a Western boundary current is because F is equal to F0 plus beta Y. So the reason of a Western boundary current is because we have beta. Okay? So... Let's imagine a line of parcels, okay, which is this one, okay. The uh, blue solid line, okay. Suppose we displace the parcel A to the north, and because the Earth is spinning in an anticlockwise way, looking from the north pole. This increases as the parcel moves to the north. So planetary vorticity increases as you move to the north. Okay, so this parcel A has been displaced up to the north. Okay. And so what is the parcel going to do? It will have to spin more in a clockwise direction, okay, in order to preserve its total vorticity. Q equal F plus, so planetary vorticity plus relative vorticity. So if planetary vorticity changes, relative vorticity must change the same way with an opposite sign in order to maintain the total vorticity constant. Okay? So we'll have to spin, so those are anomalies, okay? those arrows, so we'll have to spin clockwise more in order to maintain the total vorticity of this parcel. Okay. So what is the effect of the spinning? It is moving the fluid that is just to the west of the original parcel slightly to the north. Okay. So this part of the parcel is moving slightly to the north and this part of the so this is a wave, right? The blue line is a wave. So the blue wave the blue wave is going to be displaced a little bit to the north and this part of the blue wave is going to be displaced a little bit to the south. Okay? And so you get the uh, dotted blue line. If you actually displace another parcel slightly to the south, F increases, and so relative vorticity has to decrease. And so the parcel is going to spin 
anti-clockwise in order to conserve total vorticity. So this part of the wave is going to be displaced a little bit to the north, and this part of the wave is going to be displaced a little bit to the south. And so you get the dotted blue line. And so if you displace all of the parcels or all of this wave a little bit, then you see that the wave is traveling to the west. Okay? There is no net mass transport, it is just the wave that is traveling to the west. Okay, so the northward displacement propagates to the west, whereas passes to the east of the original displacement are returned to the original position. Okay. And so this is happening because you have beta, meaning that f varies with latitude. So if you move your parcels in the latitudinal direction, a little bit to the north or a little bit to the south, then beta changes. And so if f goes up and down in the meridional direction, then relative vorticity will have to compensate in order to conserve total vorticity. Okay? And so what we have just described is what you must know already, which is the westward propagation of a simple Raspberry wave. Right? So a gravity wave, what is the restoring term of a gravity wave? Gravity. And what is the restoring term of a Raspberry wave? or beta, right? So a gravity wave moves up and down in, or in the vertical direction, okay? And gravity is the restoring term. Whereas a Rossby wave moves meridionally, north and south, and the restoring term in these parcels, A and B, is beta. So you go slightly to the north, and then you're trying to go back slightly to the south, but you overshoot and you continue to move around a latitude circle. So this is F, some value, some value of F, and then your Rossby wave will travel westward, okay, along this uh, latitude circle. Okay. And the restoring term is B. So this is y, and this is x. Okay. What makes the Rossby wave move to the west is beta. Okay. And you've derived the Rossby wave through the uh, vorticity equation, I guess. Okay. So given that we, given that we are here, this solution with beta, okay, this is the solution that we get with beta. Now we know that the fact that the uh, wind stress is squashed to the west, or you have a boundary current on the west, or a boundary correction on the west, is actually due to Rossby waves. Okay. So here, so imagine that you have an east-west symmetric jar set up. Okay. So imagine that you are here at the top. F is a constant. Imagine you can do that. Imagine that Coriolis is a constant, okay? And so there is no meridional variation in F. And so you have a totally symmetric jar. Imagine that you can suddenly switch this jar from an F plane to a beta plane. Suddenly there will be beta. Suddenly there will be Rossby waves propagating to the west. And slowly, that symmetrical gyre will be squashed to the west because the effect of the Rossby waves is to travel to the west and it will move the gyre to the west. It will try to do that forever, but we have coast, we have coastlines, right? we have continents, and that's why you develop a close wind driven gyre which is squashed to the west. Okay. So the differential rotation, or beta, you disagree and you just leave the room. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
So the differential rotation, or beta, tries to move the whole pattern to the west. So it tries to squish all of this to the west. And what you get is this. You cannot do that uh, forever because there is a cost line. Okay? And so the gyre squishes up against the western boundary, creating an intense western boundary current. Okay, that's the reason why you have a western boundary current. It's not friction. Once you develop a western boundary current, then you have to balance vorticity. The interior vorticity will be a balance between the Winsor's curl and beta. And in the western boundary current, beta will be balanced by some friction. In the Stommel model is linear bottom drag. In the next model is going to be horizontal friction. But the reason of the western boundary current is not friction. Friction is just a way of balancing vorticity. Okay? This is important. And so this way of viewing the matter serves to emphasize that it is not the frictional effects that cause the western intensification. Frictional effects allow the flow to come into equilibrium with an intense western boundary current, with the ultimate cause being the westward propagation due to differential rotation. So westward propagation of Rossby waves due to the fact that beta is not equal to zero. Now that we know that, we can still talk about friction anyway, because friction is necessary to balance, to balance the input of vorticity. But now we know that that is not the reason for the existence of the Western boundary. Okay. So, linear bottom drag was very useful in understanding, in, in developing a western boundary current, but it doesn't, make, it doesn't make much of a sense to use linear bottom drag. You missed the best explanation. Okay. So then Munch, Walter Munch, came. And he said, okay, well, circulation doesn't reach all the way down to the bottom, so using a vertical integrated model or a homogeneous model is it's easy to do it analytically, but we know that that is not true, okay? The ocean is stratified, the wind stress is not felt all the way down to the bottom. And so what Munt did is extending the Stommel problem. And what he did was introducing lateral harmonic viscosity. Okay, so now the uh, MOOC model looks like this, which is um, similar to the Stommel model. Okay, you have the uh, beat advection, you have the curl of the wind stress at the surface, but now you don't have a uh, linear bottom drag. What you have is harmonic viscosity, and we will we will derive this in a second. Okay, so he introduced. Um, lateral harmonic viscosity. Okay. And if you use the uh, uh, stream function, it looks like this. Okay. So now you need another boundary condition. And you can choose two types of boundary conditions. Okay. One is zero vorticity. So vorticity is equal to zero. And because psi, the streamline, is equal to zero along the boundary, this is equivalent to this expression, okay, where n is normal to the, to the boundary. So at x equals 0, this condition means that dv by dx is equal to 0. So there is no horizontal shear at the boundary. And that's called free slip condition. You might use it in your manual methods. Okay. This is not what we're going to use. What we're going to use is the second option. So no flow along the boundary. Okay, so deep psi uh, dn is equal to zero. And so that means that at x equals zero, so here, this condition becomes that v is equal to zero if you substitute the expression for the stream function. So this means that the uh, Maridona velocity must be equal to zero at x equal to zero. So what the MOOC model does is bringing Maridona velocity to zero at the boundary. Okay, so if you look at the boundary, v is equal to zero, and then, 
and then it grows. Okay? And so that is called the uh, no slip condition. Okay? So u is equal to zero, we knew already. Now v is also equal to zero at the boundary because of the lateral frictional effects. Okay? So that's a no slip condition. So if you use again the same wind stress expression, you know dimensionalize the same way, but now you have this harmonic viscosity component. Again, you can do this. I mean, it's, it's simple. It takes a little bit. You get, again, a uh, small number epsilon, which now looks like this. And the full solution is, again, an interior solution plus a boundary correction. Okay? Same thing. So now the Munch problem looks like this. Remember, we did the same. It just looked a little bit different. Now you have all the four terms here. So the leading order balance is between these two. Okay, the leading order balance is between these two. The interior solution, remember, was this, where c is equal to one. And if you like algebra, you will end up to the solution for the moon problem, which is a little bit more uh, cumbersome. Okay, so that's the solution of the moon problem by using uh, lateral harmonic viscosity. So the important thing of the Munch problem is that this boundary layer in the Munch model, okay, this boundary layer brings both the tangential and the normal velocity to zero. So here v is equal to zero, and u was already equal to zero. Okay, that's that's one of the main differences. And you can see here. Here you can see the solution of the stumble problem, the numerical solution. You take that expression for the swing function of the stumble problem and the solution of the Moon problem, and you numerically solve uh, the two models. And in one case, you get the Stommel model, which is the one that we've looked at so far. And this is the Munch model with the horizontal harmonic viscosity, lateral harmonic viscosity. Okay. In the Stommel model, you only had the boundary condition of u equals 0, but not v equals 0. So if you actually look at the meridional velocity, here is negative, okay, it's below 0. And that's the interior solution. Remember, the flow is going to the south, towards the equator, for that particular wind stress. Okay? That would be this meridional velocity going to the south. You see it's relatively weak, but the interior solution is very large. Okay? All this area, all this flow, is compensated by this area of return flow to the north. Okay, and you see that V now is positive, is growing into the boundary correction, but when V touches the boundary, it's not zero. Okay. So this is the Stommel solution. If you look at the Munch solution, now V is set to zero at the boundary as well, because we have a lateral friction, and we have chosen the snow leap condition. So now you have a negative interior flow in Zvergiu balance, which is compensated by a positive western boundary current, but in this case the meridional velocity goes to zero at the boundary, okay? which is probably more realistic. Okay. So that's the main difference between the Stommel and the Munch problem. And if you actually look at the uh, Munch original paper, this is the expression for the wind stress they used, the one on the left. Okay, which is a little bit more realistic, so it includes the subtropical gyre, the subpolar gyre, and the uh, trade winds, the doldrums, and the trade winds below. Okay? So he used a quasi-realistic wind stress, and then he solved his problem, and he actually got this figure, okay? which is not just for a subtropical gyre, what we did so far, but it actually includes a subpolar jar where the wind stress curl reverses the sign. So instead of having a uh, interior flow towards the equator, now we have an interior flow towards the pole, 
and a western boundary current returning all that flow towards the equator okay but it's still on the western boundary okay so this is the full monk's wind driven circulation okay so now it includes not just the subtropical gyre but the subpolar gyre as well we use a very simple wind stress pattern to solve it analytically but you can use a more realistic wind stress that will induce a subtropical gyre and a subpolar gyre whatever you want and then you will get this kind of solution for more than one gyre how thick is the boundary layer in the monk problem you can do the same thing that we did for the stubble problem okay so these two terms have to balance each other you do a scale analysis and so beta in the boundary layer goes like the uh, harmonic viscosity over l cube and so l is now the thickness of the boundary layer and so that means that the boundary layer goes like nu over beta one third okay. which is similar to the stomach problem but it's different because now you don't have um, r the linear bottom drag now you have nu which is the uh, uh, lateral harmonic viscosity okay so this is a table summarizing common things and differences between the two models Remember that these are simple analytical models trying to describe the uh, wind driven gyres, so they're not realistic, okay? But they give you a lot of information, and, and with, with simple equations and a few simple ingredients, they developed a theory for the interior's value balance and the existence of a Western boundary current. You must imagine that this was done in the, uh, I think in the 40s, 48, was Monk, Monk paper was 48, 1950. Okay, 1950. In 1950, nobody knew why there was a Western boundary current. They knew there was one, but they couldn't explain the existence of a Western boundary current. So with this simple model that you might think this is not realistic, it doesn't include this and that, but with this very, very simple analytical model, they explained the existence of a boundary current and why that boundary current was on the West. Okay, so extremely powerful. So what is the model that we have used so far? is a vertical integrated model or a homogeneous fluid which is not realistic but very powerful and we have neglected all the nonlinearities okay which again is not is not realistic you can take the uh, time dependent nonlinear stommel monk problem solve it numerically and you will get a slightly more realistic solution but with this simple model you already explain why there is a western boundary the model uses a flat bottom motion, and we will see that that makes a lot of change if you include a no flat bottom. So basically what you want to include, if this is Z and this is X, okay, we're not talking about having ridges at the top, at the bottom of the floor, okay, but a no flat ocean means that you have sides. This is the real, real. This is more like the real ocean, right? You have a sloping, you have a sloping boundary near the near the coast, okay? And so having a no flat bottom, so sloping boundaries, will change the uh, vorticity balance near the boundary current. So that would be very useful, very important to add a no flat bottom motion but so far we have used a flat bottom motion and so in the stomach model what we do is using bottom friction with the linear drag okay which is not very realistic in the model we use lateral friction with a newtonian harmonic viscosity which is much more realistic okay? still very simple but more realistic what is the solution of these two very very simple models the transport in this vertical interior is towards the equator for an anticyclonic wind stress curve. Okay, so for an anticyclonic wind stress curve, you have an interior transport uh, which is towards the equator in the northern hemisphere. This vertical transport is exactly balanced by a pole wave transport in the western boundary current. Okay, so all this flow is balanced by the pole wave boundary current transport. 
The boundary layer satisfies mass conservation, so as much water you bring to the south is what you have to bring back to the north. It must be a western boundary layer so that friction can provide a force to oppose the uh, input of vorticity. So friction is not the reason for the western boundary current, but you need friction in order to balance the input of the momentum at the surface. And so in this model, the boundary layer is a frictional boundary layer. Actually, the more advanced theories, you can develop a wind and gyro with a western boundary current without friction. But that's a different story. Okay? But friction so far is needed to balance vorticity. It's not the reason for the western boundary. The western location does not depend on the sign of the Coriolis parameter, nor on the sign of the wind stress. If you remember the uh, original moon paper, the wind stress curl here as one sign, the wind stress curl here as a different sign, you always find a western boundary current. If you go to the southern hemisphere, if you look one of the original, uh, one of the first uh, diagrams that I show you, if you go on the southern hemisphere, South Atlantic, South Pacific, you always find a western boundary current in the southern hemisphere as well. So it, it doesn't depend on F, and it doesn't depend on the sign of the wind stress. But it does depend on the sign of beta, and so on the direction of the rotation. So you can change the sign of the wind stress, you get a western boundary current. Subtropical gyre and subpolar gyre, they both have a western boundary current. You can change the sign of F, you can go to the southern hemisphere, and you still find a western boundary current. You find a western boundary current along Argentina and Brazil, you find a western boundary current along the uh, uh, East Australia. Okay. So the western boundary current always exists in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. But if you change the sign of beta by changing the sign of the rotation of the Earth, you actually get eastern boundary currents. Because now Rossby waves, they travel the other way. Okay. So it, Western boundary, so actually people did that, you know, with a climate model. Instead of rotating the climate model with, uh, you know, omega, whatever it is, you switch the sign of omega of the rotation of the planet. And it's, it's quite fun, okay? You can, I, I think you can, you can find some movies on the internet, okay? There are some simulations of what if the Earth was spinning the other way around, okay? Many things are the same, but it's not, it's not, it's not symmetric, so it's not like things just flip, okay? So a lot of things actually change a lot. But one of the things that does flip is the boundary current, from a western boundary current to an eastern boundary current. Okay, so suddenly you find an eastern boundary current instead of a western boundary current. Precipitation patterns and things like that, and atmospheric circulation is quasi symmetric, but then there are no linear feedbacks, and there's a lot of, I don't remember exactly what, but there's a lot of things that don't simply flip from one side to the other. Okay, but it's, it's interesting to see, and, and you, can, you can try to do it analytically if you switch the sign of the wind stress, if you switch the sign of F, you always find a western boundary current. Okay. In the Stoneman model, the balance in the western boundary layer is between beta and the linear bottom drag. Okay. So, in the western boundary current in Stoneman, you have a balance between beta and linear bottom drag. In the, <coughs> in the Moog model, the balance is between beta and uh, lateral friction. Okay. And this is the expression for both for both boundary layer thicknesses. Yes. Is there any gain in considering both like and also? Yes, yes. So, <coughs> neither the Stallman nor the Moog model are accurate representations, okay, we know. You need to include nonlinearities, you need to include topographic effects. So, you could use the nonlinear Stommel Moog problem, which is all of this, okay, is time dependent, is nonlinear. You have the Jacobin here, you have the beta effect. You have a Winston's curl at the surface, you have bottom uh, drag, and you have lateral friction. 
you can take the nonlinear time dependent storm and move problem, solve that numerically, and get a slightly more realistic uh, solution. Okay. Or you could take the steady nonlinear storm and move problem and just remove any time dependency and, and get this. Okay. It's still it's still um still an approximation, so uh, one of the things that that I learned or people taught me is that if you start with a simple model, because you're trying to reproduce in a simple model a very complicated physical uh, situation, it's nice to add pieces to the simple model because then you get you know you get a boundary correction and then you add the topographic effects and you see how the solution changes. But if you start with a simple model and then you start adding too many pieces, then you lose the simplicity of the model and you will never get to a full solution because you are you have started with some simplifications and some approximations. So at some point you are in between between a simple model and, and, and a realistic, let's say, climate model in this case. So at some point you have to stop adding things or you have to start from scratch from a full Navier-Stokes equations. Right? So then things got complicated, it's not, it's not analytically tractable, you have to do it numerically, so what is the point? You start adding things that is, is, is never going to get realistic as a full Navier stock solution, so, and, and you lose the physical intuition of the equation, so at some point it's, it's better to stop adding things. You don't. Uh, nobody got worried when they saw this. This doesn't look like reality, right? But nobody got worried. Actually, everybody got like, super excited because with a very simple model, you explain the interior's vector transport, the existence of a boundary current, and the existence of a western boundary current. And you stop there. Or you add a couple of things, we will add topography, okay? But Storm and the Moon, they didn't get worried when they when they found this. When Munch published this, he didn't get worried, he got excited. Right? I can see an interior as virtual transport and I can see a western boundary current. Nobody ever explained why there is a western boundary current, I just did. It doesn't look like a real Gulf Stream, sure. But now I can tell you why there is a Gulf Stream. And that, that is the reason why you want to build a simple physical model. Because you want to explain the reason for things. And you want to explain how they behave. You don't want to reproduce the details of that physical system. You want to explain why that system behaves the way it does. If you want to get a realistic Gauss stream, then you have to take the full Navier-Stokes equations, put them into a climate model, and I'll show you. Okay. Was that the question? Yeah. That was the question, right? So, you have a simple model. It doesn't reproduce reality. You don't get worried because your, your intention is not to reproduce reality. Your intention is to reproduce some of the features or some of the reasons why that system behaves the way it does. Okay, so those two models are simple, they don't represent reality, but it doesn't matter. They explain the main feature of reality, which is what we care. Okay. And so why, why was that important? So I'll, I'll stop with this explanation and then I'll show you more. Why was that important? So this is the first map of the Gulf Stream. Uh, so on the left is the United States and Canada. Okay, this is Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, and Canada. Okay, and this is the Atlantic Ocean. This thing here, which looks like a river, is supposed to be the Gulf Stream. Okay? So this is the first map of, uh, of the Gulf Stream, and that was made by Franklin, the US president, who was also actually a geographer, a geographer, I think. Okay, so he was the first one to map 
the Gulf Stream. And how did he map the Gulf Stream? Was talking to his uh, cousin. I'm not sure if it was his cousin. I actually forgot to write down where I got this <laughs> this sentence. Okay, I just copied this from somewhere and I forgot where. I'm not supposed to say this. Uh, uh, I, I thought it was the husband of his sister, but I wrote down cousin, so it doesn't matter. This Timothy Folger, and this Timothy Folger was a captain of a merchant ship. Okay, and so he asked why it took ships like Folgers so less time to reach America, or maybe it was the UK. Then he took official mail ships. And so it struck fall that the British mail captains didn't know about the Gulf Stream. So what was happening is that the British uh, ships were traveling from the UK to the US, let's say in this route, okay? Instead of going like they did after, and they know now, following the trade winds, of course, okay? What they were doing is going against the Gulf Stream. Whereas Folger was an American, okay, and he knew very well this region, and he was a merchant ship, he would follow the Gulf Stream. Okay? Where, and he became well acquainted on the Gulf Stream years before when he was a whaler, so he was, he was hunting whales. Okay? And so Folger, he told Franklin, the president, that whalers knew about the warm and strong current, okay? and they used them with their ships, to kill the whales. Okay. But this is the uh, nice anecdote, is that mail ships from the UK, from the British, you remember that the, uh, America was getting out of uh, the British Empire, they were too wise okay, to uh, follow the advice from simple American fishermen. So they said, we are, we are British, we know what we're doing. And so they were, they were, they were uh, sailing against the Gulf Stream. Anyway, kind of like what they're doing now, they're sitting against the EU. Uh, so, and so this is, this is the map that Franklin did, or drew, of the Gulf Stream, okay? He didn't know how the Gulf Stream looked like, he just knew that the Gulf Stream was warm, was strong, and it was traveling from the equator along Florida, and then at some point crossing into the Atlantic Ocean. Obviously, this wasn't a real representation of the Gulf Stream, but it was much better than what the British knew. Now we know that the Gulf Stream looks much more like this. Okay? This is a satellite image of sea surface temperature. Red is warm, blue is cold. Okay? And you can see this warm current starting from the Caribbean Sea, okay? traveling along the US coast. At some point, it detaches from the coast and then it starts breaking into eddies and filaments. There's a lot of instabilities going on. And it breaks into many structures. You can see a cold eddy here. And you can see a warm eddy developing on the other side. So it's very important, these instabilities, because they also mix traces horizontally. They bring cold water on the warm side, and they bring warm water on the cold side. And then it starts flowing into the North Atlantic. Okay. So we know that this is the reality. So it's time dependent. This, this is a picture from a satellite, if you take the same picture the day after or the day before, it's going to look differently. So you need a time-dependent model. This is highly nonlinear, as you can see. So you would need a nonlinear storm and look problem to uh, uh, try to reproduce this western boundary current. Okay. But the simple storm model or the simple MOOC problem, which is time-independent without nonlinearity, explains why there is a western boundary current, which is at the time was more than enough. Okay, so it looks like this. We know it looks like this. So if you really want, if you really want to reproduce the Gulf Stream, as good as you can, then you take the full navier stokes equation with some approximation, so hydrostatic balance, Hydrostatic balance uh, and uh, continuity. Hmm? continuity. Sure, sure, but continuity is an approximation. Um, 
Yeah, so, so all, all ocean models are hydrostatic. There is no global model which is no hydrostatic so far. And so you take the best model that you can with all the uh, physical equations that we know and uh, with as much high resolution as you can. This is a nice simulation from a, from a couple model, so CM, couple model. Um, and now I'm going to show you the uh, simulation of sea surface temperature. The point here is that they just show you New York and what you see here on the left is Manhattan and on the right is the uh, grid box of the ocean model which is 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 degrees okay so it's one tenth of a degree this is super high for an ocean model okay this this is very very high resolution for a global ocean model regional ocean models can be finer in resolution but for a global ocean model especially a capital ocean model one tenth of a degree is very 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 high resolution okay so this is telling you that in the grid box and we will compute all the equations, conservation of momentum, advection, traces, and everything, at the corners of this grid box, or at the center, depending if it's a big grid or a C grid. So whatever is inside this grid box is not resolved by the model. Okay? The model resolves here, 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 and here. What is happening here, the model doesn't know. So you need parameterizations, sub-grid scale parameterizations, for what is happening inside here. So what is happening inside of Manhattan, for example, the model doesn't know. Okay? You need parameterizations. But anyway, this is super high resolution for a global ocean model. So these are all the uh, 0.1 times 0.1 grid cells in the ocean model, where all the equations will be step forward numerically. Okay? Navier-Stokes equations, not a simple wind-driven jar solution. So if you put your momentum equation, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, tracer equations and everything into each of those grid cells, and then you integrate in time, what you get is this. You get a gas stream, beautiful gas stream, right? Now it's time dependent, you see how it moves, it's not linear, extremely not linear, and you see all of these nice structures Water, at some point you will see some cold eddy in here and some warm eddy going on the other side. This is sea surface temperature. So you see the very cold sea ice flowing down Canada. See how beautiful this is? And then going into, uh, well, along the coast. Okay. Now it will go somewhere else. So this is, this is time as it has as it moves forward in time. Now this is the uh, equatorial Pacific. You see these are tropical instability waves. There's some El Nino going on here. And this, this nice instability are tropical instability waves. If you see these rolls traveling, those are tropical instability waves traveling to the west. Okay, see how beautiful that is. And you see all these structures and eddies everywhere. And you see that the you should, you should see the difference in these eddies, the difference in size of eddies between here close to the equator and as you move towards the pole. Okay? Those eddies become smaller and smaller and smaller because they, they are balanced vortices and they, uh, the, the balance is achieved on, a, on a special scales similar to the Rossby radius. And the Rossby radius is, is becoming smaller and smaller as you go towards the poles. And so those eddies are big in the equator, so you don't need much resolution to resolve them. And the, those eddies are very small close to the poles or approaching the poles, so you need a lot of resolution to resolve those eddies as you move away from the equator. This is now another western boundary current, which is called the Kuroshio. Right? It's explained by the Stommel and the Munch model. It looks different because reality is different, but you have an interior flow and a western boundary current. This is now South Africa, and this is the Agulas current. I think I'll show you a picture of the uh, Agulas rings. You see the Agulas rings traveling into the Atlantic, bringing warm and salty water into the Atlantic. This is the Antarctic circumpolar current. And you have the Agulas current. You see how warm this is. The Agulas current is traveling to the south. It enters the Antarctic circumpolar current, but 
during this instability process, some eddies are detached from the Agulhas current and they enter the Atlantic Ocean, bringing Indian water into the Atlantic. The equatorial Atlantic, again, you see tropical instability waves traveling, and you see all this warm water entering the Caribbean seas and then feeding the Gulf Stream. Okay. And you can watch this for hours. Yes. <laughs> but it will stop at some point. Okay, so if you want to reproduce reality, you build a model like this. It's still not real because there are still things that are missing. The grid cell of the ocean is uh, 10 kilometers or so, okay? So whatever is more than 10 kilometers is not resolved by the model. Either you parameterize it or you just don't see it. So it's still not reality, but it's very, very good. <laughs> it's very fun to watch. But if you want to explain why there is a Western boundary current, you don't need this complicated and expensive model. You just need the Stoneman model or the Munch model. And then you can tell why there is a Western boundary current. Okay. Spawn. 